Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation. As Director of Lectures and Seminars, it's my privilege to welcome everyone to our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. Of course, we welcome those who are joining us on our Heritage.org website as well. Uh, everyone in-house, if you'll make that last courtesy check that cell phones have been turned off, it will be appreciated, especially when it's the speaker, since the microphones are closer to yours. We will, of course, post the program within 24 hours on our Heritage website for everyone's future reference. Hosting our program this morning and introducing our special guest is Heritage's Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, Phil Truluck. Phil? Thank you. Thank you. What a delight to be here today with uh, an old friend, or a longtime friend, Pat Toomey. Senator Pat Toomey. That has a really nice ring to it, doesn't it? <laughs> From Swiker to Toomey. Not a very long journey, right? Welcome all of you here today. We pre appreciate you coming. It, it is special to, to have Pat Toomey over here. Um, he's been a longtime friend, as I mentioned. But it's also sort of interesting that he really does not have the sort of typical background you expect of a United States Senator. He's actually run businesses. He's uh, started at a very young age doing that. Uh, he's done all kind of things that a lot of the senators have not done, like create jobs and those kind of little, little tidbits, which uh, doesn't necessarily qualify him for anything in the Senate. He grew up in a blue-collar working family, working-class family in Providence, Rhode Island. His father was a U.S. Marine, and his mother worked part-time in the parish church. And he started his own business when he was 10 years old, mowing yards, going around the neighborhood with little cards that he made up with his name and on it. I did that too, but I didn't think about the card business. That was very <laughs> smart. Are you sure you weren't a paper boy too? You know, I mean, it's, uh, the background is very interesting. So he, he really found out early on at age 10 uh, sort of what makes the world work and how to earn money and how to create jobs. In that case, the one job. I did that too when I was growing up. My father, i never forget, gave me $50 to buy a lawnmower. But before I could take any profits from it, I had to pay him back first. Government doesn't work that way, does it? <laughs> Next, uh, he, uh, he's graduated from a Catholic high school where he had earned an academic scholarship and graduated valedictorian, of course, from his high school, and then went on to study political science at Harvard. <clears throat> Next, he went to New York City and worked in the financial services industry, uh, and he also spent a year in financial services in Hong Kong. And after having seen the big world, he moved to Allentown, Pennsylvania, and started his business. The first Rookies restaurant? Rookies? Yeah. Rookies? Maybe you can tell us about that. but. Uh, it was such a success that he opened another one, and in the course of doing this, he created hundreds of jobs and learned all about the challenges of, of running a small business. Uh, these challenges led him to get into the political side, and uh, he first uh, won a seat on the Government Study Commission in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where he pushed for rules that would make it harder for cities to raise taxes on its residents. And next, after that, he ran for the U.S. House of Representatives and, of course, served for three terms in the House. In Congress, he worked well, long time before it started became popular to talk about the federal spending and how to reduce it. He worked for many, many years, and he worked against the earmark spending and so forth. He is not a recent convert to this battle. His dedication to limited government and cutting taxes has earned him recognition from all kinds of groups that deal with this, the Council for Citizens Against Government Waste, Americans for Tax Reform, National Taxpayers Union, the U.S. Chamber, and so forth. In between, before joining, coming into the United States Senate, he served as president of the Club for Growth, which is a really great group of people who believe that prosperity and opportunity come from economic freedom. Well, Senator Toomey, Toomey as a former small business owner, knows that the massive federal budget deficit is unsustainable because of out-of-control government spending, not because the credit limit is too low. The federal government is about to run into its self-imposed debt limit of $14.3 trillion. Fortunately this time, Congress has some options, and it's time to consider those options carefully. 
The Senate has introduced a, bull, a bill called the Full Faith and Credit Act, and we are very eager to learn all about that today. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Senator Pat Toomey. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Phil, thank you for that kind introduction, and thanks for having me today. It, uh, this is uh, great fun for me to be back at the Heritage Foundation. I love this organization. I love the work that Heritage does. I think it's one of the most uh, important thought leaders on the uh, really in the entire uh, political spectrum. Of course, it comes from uh, the center-right part of the spectrum, which is uh, uh, home to uh, most of us in attendance today, I suspect. Um, but uh, you guys do great work, and it's very, very important to provide that intellectual underpinning for the policies that will uh, enable us to expand and defend freedom and have the prosperity that comes uh, from that freedom. So it was fun to work with Heritage when I was a House member. It was great fun to work with Heritage when I was at the Club for Growth, and it's terrific to be back now. I see, uh, I see with us today my former colleague, Ernest Istook. Ernest, it's great to see you, and I appreciate the work that you do. And I spotted Chris Chicola, the president of the Club for Growth, and uh, the man to whom I am very grateful for, for taking over and doing a fabulous job at the club. Um, so uh, welcome uh, to both of you. Um, I wanted to, uh, to talk about my bill and talk a little bit about the debt limit, um, but I wanted to start with a little bit of uh, context, if I could. Uh, Phil mentioned a word that comes up a lot of times in the discussion about uh, our budget situation. He, uh, he said it's unsustainable, and I completely agree that it's unsustainable. We hear that a lot. But I thought it might be worth reflecting a little bit on what, what does that mean? What exactly does it mean to have a fiscal trajectory that is unsustainable? Um, I, I also should start off by uh, agreeing with Phil. The root cause of this problem is not that we're undertaxed. And in fact, the deficits, which are a huge, huge problem, are actually a symptom of what's actually driving all of this, and that is excessive spending. So the, the heart of this problem, the heart of the unsustainable fiscal trajectory that we're on uh, is a spending problem. And it's unsustainable uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I would argue that we are already suffering from a subpar, subnormal economic recovery, in part because of the excess spending, the huge uh, deficits, the debt that we're racking up, and the um, the anxiety, the worries, the cloud on the horizon that all of that introduces has a chilling effect on private investment and economic growth. So we're already suffering from the effects of this uh, in certain ways. Um, I would also strongly argue that contrary to what many in this town and in this administration believe, greater government spending does not create wealth. Uh, there's some people who seem to think that the more the government spends, the richer we all become. It is in fact the opposite. In fact, if we have less government, smaller government, more economic freedom, m greater opportunity to allocate resources in the marketplace, that is the mechanism that creates more wealth, creates more rational investment, creates more productive investment, it leads to more jobs, stronger growth, higher standard of living. So quite contrary to some of the prevailing wisdom, all of this government spending is not creating jobs, it's not creating prosperity, and it won't. One of the things it will do, though, if we stay on this path, is we'll have much higher taxes. Uh, that is always in an inevitable consequence of too much spending. And higher taxes absolutely uh, destroy economic growth for a number of reasons. The most salient of one, in my view, is that it, uh, it uh, discourages incentive. It diminishes incentives. Uh, it says to the entrepreneur who's contemplating taking a risk that you're going to get to keep less of whatever rewards there might be if your venture is successful and when you diminish the returns on risk taking you get less risk taking and in that case that means you also get fewer jobs fewer businesses starting and and that is a clear and direct consequence of higher taxes also by the way this is a real threat to our own national security and this isn't just my saying so the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff himself admiral mullen has said that the greatest threat to america is our debt this is a man who understands very well that our ability to defend ourselves militarily, our ability to remain the strongest, the most sophisticated, the most technologically advanced and well-equipped armed force in the world is entirely a function of our economic strength. And if our economic strength is damaged and our debt burden is, is too high, it jeopardizes our ability to retain 
that position. So uh, in, in all of these ways, uh, I would argue that uh, the current path we're on is unsustainable, but uh, the, the thing that worries me um, as much as anything else is the danger that we could have a sudden and catastrophic shock as a result of the imprudent policies that we're pursuing. A collapse of the dollar, a huge run in inflation that would be enormously disruptive economically, <coughs> um, failed treasury auction in which we attempt to auction off debt and find that uh, we're unable to do so. Um, I'm not predicting that any of these things are going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next week, but I am suggesting that these are the things that happen to countries that run too much debt for too long. In fact, they always happen if you go too far into debt and you very seldom know when they're going to happen. And they very often happen with very little warning. Very, very little warning. They can suddenly um, emerge as devastating uh, events. And, and that's something that could be, uh, it could be in our future if we don't change the path that we're on. Um, so how, how have we gotten here? And uh, you know, what, it, what, is, what has been this path that has gotten us to this unsustainable point? Well, as I said early on, it's spending. It's spending has been uh, the problem. Um, and think about how dramatically spending has accelerated uh, very, very recently. As recently as 2007, some of us can remember back that far, right? As recently as 2007, total federal spending was less than 20% of GDP. And that was about where it had been for decades, right? Roughly 20%, a little less than 20% of GDP. Uh, last year it was 25% of GDP. So I can do the math. That is a 25% increase in the size of government overnight. That is huge. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. By other measures, the uh, growth has been stunning as well. Um, total spending now uh, is more than twice as high as the percentage of GDP as it was at the peak of the New Deal when the government was in a very uh, aggressive expansionary mode. Since the year 2000, the nominal federal spending has doubled. Imagine, right? The annual budget for the federal government is now twice what it was in the year 2000. So with all that spending, as I said earlier, one of the consequences is these huge deficits. Um, but again, this is a very recent phenomenon that we've gotten into these massive deficits. In 2006, the federal deficit was about $248 billion, less than 2% of GDP. <coughs> that was the size of our deficit. In 2007, it was smaller than that even. Actually, it was just a little over 1% of GDP, which is really a very, very modest scale. Uh, no longer the case in 2010 and 2011, we've been running deficits that are on the order of about 10% uh, between over 9 and, and close to 11% of GDP, $1.5 trillion. Just a staggering increase in a very short period of time. We're now borrowing, or at least uh, for this last fiscal year, borrowing almost 40 cents of every dollar that the government spends. Well, um, annual deficits obviously are um, funded by issuing new debt. And so our debt grows to the extent that uh, we run a deficit in a given year and add more debt to pay for that. There too, I think it's useful to look at some context. In 1988, the total debt of our federal government was about 41% of our total economy, about 41% of GDP. In 2008, the total debt of our federal government was about 40% of GDP. Today, it's about 64% of GDP, and by the end of this fiscal year, just a few months from now, it'll be 72% of our GDP. This is the publicly held debt, mind you. This is the, the bonds that are held by investors, American and others, who uh, actually expect and deserve to get interest and principal payments on their bonds. Uh, and the fact is, we are heading contrary to what the President's budget projects, if you look at more realistic projections of the current path that we're on. We're heading towards something on the order of 100% of GDP, and, and who knows where it goes from here. Um, I would suggest that that puts you well into the range of, uh, of catastrophic debt level. And, and it's not just theoretical, right? Um, not too long ago, we all um, uh, probably learned more than we knew before about the uh, fiscal behavior of a little country on the edge of Europe because the European sovereign debt crisis was kicked off by little tiny Greece, a country that represents, I think, slightly less than 
of the GDP of the European Union. And they were nevertheless able to precipitate a um, pretty serious uh, debt crisis throughout the continent. And they did that because they were running deficits of 13.6% of their GDP. Well, we're at 11. Um, now, those who criticize me and say, this is, you know, I'm an alarmist, they'll say, well, Greece had a higher total debt burden. That's true. Their debt burden was a little over 110% of GDP. Uh, we are screaming in that direction. Um, there's a reason that too much debt causes these problems and always causes these problems. One is that it crowds out private investment. That's sort of the immediate uh, early uh, cost of too much government borrowing. Its uh, resources are less available to the much more productive private sector. But the other, one of the other very obvious um, and very worrisome to me factors is just the sheer cost of servicing this debt. Um, take just, just some very round numbers that uh, I think might put this in some perspective. Um, let, let's say we do, in fact, get to 100%, uh, get to the point where our debt is 100% of GDP, 100% of our total economic output, which, by the way, most private analysts think we're heading to, and we'll be at that point before 2020 on the path that we're on. Well, over the last 20 years, prior to the very recent, very abnormally low interest rate environment engineered by the Fed, uh, the average cost of funds for the federal government was just below 6%. It's just the combined average cost of our bonds. So let's say that we're at 100% of debt to GDP and interest rates revert to their historical norm. I think you could make a strong case, by the way, that they're likely to go much higher than that, in part because of the debt, in part because of the Fed. But just at 6%, average interest expense on a debt that's 100% of GDP well, the math is obvious. The debt service is 6% of GDP, right? Well, 6% of GDP is one-third of all the revenue that the federal government has routinely collected over recent decades, right? Hauser's Law, which uh, specifies that it seems no matter what combination of tax rates and tax uh, structure we have, the revenue the federal government collects from taxes has been just a little over 18% of GDP. Can you imagine if a third of all that revenue has to be dedicated just to interest. And by the way, that, as I remind you, is assuming that interest rates merely revert to where they have historically been. They could go much, much higher. So these are some of the reasons why I think this is um, just very, very worrisome. Um, ultimately, at some point when people or families or businesses or states or federal governments borrow too much money, at some point, markets lose confidence in their ability to repay that money. And that's what triggers the crisis. And it's very, very hard to predict when that might occur. Um, right now, I think we have two big opportunities to do something about this. And as you may have gathered, my opinion is we don't have any time to lose. We should seize this moment because we've got to begin to reverse this trajectory that we're on. One of the opportunities is the continuing resolution, the CR. This is the bill, as you know, that funds the activity of the government for the remainder of this fiscal year. And the current continuing resolution expires in early March, and so Congress has got to decide what to do about funding the operations of government after March through the end of the fiscal year. Um, and I have to tell you, I am so proud of the conservatives in the House, a lot of freshmen members of the House who stood up and said, you know, we made a commitment to the American people that we were going to cut this spending by $100 billion, and by gosh, that's what we're going to do. And when the initial version of the bill came out with smaller cuts, they sent the Appropriation Committee back to the drawing board. And they said, no, no you got you to cut 100. And you know what? In some areas, it might actually be somewhat painful, but you got to do it. And by the way, when you consider the massive run-up in spending in recent years that I talked about, this really isn't that draconian a cut. But it's real progress. It's very, very encouraging. It's changing the dynamic in this town. In the six years that I was in the House, let me promise you, the only discussion ever about spending was how much it will grow. And now we're having a discussion about how much we're going to cut it. And when a significant faction of the House of Representatives stands up to the leadership and the appropriators and say, you've made some cuts, but it's not enough, and they have to go back to the drawing board, 
let me just tell you that is a very, very constructive dynamic. This is very good news for the hope that we're going to be able to get this under control. Now, of course, that's just the beginning of the story. I believe, my understanding is, the President has already issued a veto threat. Uh, he's, uh, he's not happy about this. And so we're going to have, you know, we're going to have a battle over this. Uh, we're going to have a battle in the Senate. You know, I'm not sure that uh, the Democratic leadership of the Senate will take up the House bill. I don't know whether they'll do something else entirely. It's, it's not clear exactly how this will play out, but I will tell you this. I think it's vitally important that Republicans in the Senate defend what the House is doing here. The, the House is, is starting us on the right path, and we need to, to defend and support that. And, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if a handful of Democrats decide that, you know what, it's time we got the message, the message from the voters, the message from last fall, the message that we're hearing from economists and analysts that we get, get this under control. So I, do, I can't, certainly can't tell you how this is going to turn out, but I am very encouraged by the beginning of this process on the CR. The second big opportunity for us is the debt limit. Uh, we'll reach the debt limit at some point in the, in the next few months. And the President has been very clear, the administration has been very clear. They want Congress to vote to raise the debt limit with no strings attached. Just authorize more borrowing. No discussion about reforms, about changing the path that we're on. Just give them the opportunity to borrow more money. I, I, I liken this to a family that is routinely spending more than their income. They're making up for the difference with credit cards. And they have finally reached their limit on all their credit cards. They don't have any more credit cards. And they're at their limit on all of them. And so the administration's position is, we'll give them another credit card. <laughs> now, don't ask them to cut spending. Don't ask them to change their pattern of behavior. Just, just let them take on more debt. I, I have to tell you, um, if we don't raise the debt ceiling immediately upon reaching it, I will be the first to acknowledge that can be disruptive. That can, uh, it can cause problems. I want to get into some of the specifics about those uh, problems. And I'm not advocating that we refuse under all circumstances to raise the debt limit. I think eventually, under the right circumstances, we should be willing to do that. But I do think it is the height of irresponsibility to simply raise that debt limit and continue spending business as usual. That would be the worst thing that we could do. And so we shouldn't do it. I, I think that we ought to insist on two things if we're going to raise the debt limit. One is real spending cuts now. The CR would be a good place to do that. Uh, but they need to be immediate, not promises of the distant future. And the second thing would be a structural process reform that will enable us to, to just get off this, this freeway to failure, as I describe it. Um, a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution that would have a spending cap as a percentage of GDP that would require a supermajority vote to raise taxes. Uh, that would be terrific. Uh, I'd, I'd certainly like to see that. Um, statutory spending caps, you could make a case for the, the uh, virtues of statutory spending caps with an automatic sequestration uh, should the government exceed the spending caps. We've had some success in getting spending controlled somewhat for limited periods with statutory spending caps. But these are the kind of things we ought to be talking about. We ought to be asking ourselves, if we're going to hand over another credit card to this out-of-control spender, what are we going to insist on so that we bring that spending under control? Um, the administration doesn't want to go there. And so instead, they have engaged in a, uh, a rather shrill, if you ask me, uh, argument in which they have misrepresented the consequences of not immediately raising the debt ceiling. Specifically, they have gone around some in the administration have gone around saying that if you don't raise the debt ceiling immediately <clears throat> upon reaching it or prior to reaching it, well, that constitutes default on our debt. And that's, that's a financial crisis. That's a disaster. That's incredibly irresponsible. That's their argument. This is not true. Failure to raise the debt limit does not constitute a default on our debt at all. And there are several clear facts that I would point out. First of all, Failure to raise the debt limit does not absolve any of us from our obligation to continue paying taxes, right? Tax revenue will be something on the order of 70 percent of everything the government plans to spend next year. Debt service, at least for next year, is only about 6 percent of everything the government's going to spend. So with revenue that's more than 10 times 
what's needed to service our debt, why in the world would we default on our debt? Well, the answer is we wouldn't. The second point that I would observe is that we have had four occasions in the last 20 years where we've reached our debt limit and didn't raise it immediately. And we never defaulted on our debts. We've, we've had government shutdowns, in fact, where payments to certain vendors were postponed, where workers were laid off, where payment obligations were delayed. But we never defaulted on our debt, and we never had a financial crisis, nor would we this time. Um, I've introduced a bill to try to make this abundantly clear, and really to take away this false argument from the debate. My bill is just 13 lines long. You can read the whole thing. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the Full Faith and Credit Act. And uh, it, what it simply does is it codifies what any Treasury Secretary would do anyway, which is in the unlikely but possible event that we reach the debt limit and don't immediately raise it, it's, it's, it instructs the Treasury Secretary to make debt service the first priority. This simply ensures that we could not under any circumstances default on our debt. Because actually defaulting on your debt would be catastrophic, right? That, would, that, would, that makes no sense. That would be a disaster. We would never do it. We should never do it. We've got a uh, profound obligation to uh, pay back that which people lend to us. We benefit enormously from the nearly universal perception that we are a virtually risk-free uh, credit in the sense that we will pay back in a timely fashion interest and principal. We, we sh certainly should never undermine that. So the administration should not be suggesting that there's a hint of a danger that this could happen because they know it wouldn't. I think that's been very irresponsible. Um, they've been fighting this effort. The administration has, Treasury Secretary Geithner in particular. Uh, they, don't, they don't like my bill, and I have a theory as to why. Um, I think they would really rather prefer to keep the specter of a default out there as a way to intimidate members of Congress into voting for the debt limit increase that they want, with no strings attached. Uh, Secretary Geithner has said, it, my bill is unworkable because it amounts to default by another name. And when you uh, drill down into what he really means by that is he's making the case that any failure to make any obligated payment is and will be construed by the market as equivalent to failing to make an interest or principal payment on a bond. I have to say, I think this is a little far-fetched. So let's see. If the federal government delays a payment to the vendor that sells pencils to the Department of Education, the world will see that as the same as failing to pay interest or principal on our bond. Uh, I mean, if we pull a contract for the guys that plant grass on the Washington Mall, uh, is that seen the same way as failure to pay interest and principles on our bond. I can tell you as a guy who used to trade treasuries, a guy used to market's plenty smart enough to know the difference. And there's a big difference. Another uh, observation that they make is that, uh, well, it's unworkable because the revenue comes in, it's lumpy, you know, it's irregular in its timing. It's not a smooth uh, function. Well, uh, it's true that the revenue comes into the government in an irregular fashion, but when you've got 10 times what you need to service your debt, and it happens that you're reaching this point at about the time when you have a surge in revenue, which is the April and this around tax time, this is not a serious uh, argument. Some of our friends have tried to suggest that somehow this gives the president uh, additional discretion. I've never quite understood this argument. It clearly uh, diminishes the president's discretion by codifying the uh, priority that he has to give. So uh, I just, uh, I'm just not buying that. Um, but I do think it's very, very important uh, that we pursue this, that we take this argument off the table. Fortunately, last week when um, Tom McClintock, who's introduced companion legislation in the House, he asked Chairman Bernanke about this uh, bill, about this idea. Chairman Bernanke immediately responded by saying, well, it certainly would uh, reduce the risk to the credit markets if we had this uh, legislation uh, in place. So we've got some support for this legislation, but we're not there yet. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for the support that we have. About half of my Senate Republican colleagues have co-sponsored the bill, and that's great. Uh, last count, something close to 60 members of the House, but we were unable to get it into the language of the CR. Um, so that, that's going to make our work a little bit tougher. Um, scholars across um, this town and across the country have endorsed this idea, including here at Heritage, and uh, I certainly appreciate that but also economists at AEI and Cato and Mercatus and activists at Freedom Works and 
NTU and ATR and Americans for Prosperity and the Club for Growth have all advocated that we take this approach. Um, so I hope we will, and I, I really hope you'll help, help to push your representative in Congress, your senators, to uh, support this legislation. The idea is simply to enable us to have an honest debate about how we're going to get spending under control, to be able to have that debate without the, the false specter of a default on our debt. Let's take that off the table and then discuss exactly what we're going to do to avoid the fiscal disaster that, uh, that looms ahead. Um, you know, the bad news in all of this is that um, it's, a, it's, it's a very serious, um, you might even say dire, uh, situation that we face. But the good news is that it's not too late. You know, we have been blessed as the, the largest and strongest economy in the world. We are the world's reserve currency. And so we've gotten a little bit of breathing room that other countries, frankly, wouldn't have. Um, it would be a huge mistake for us to uh, fail to seize this opportunity uh, to fix what's broken, to correct this problem, and to put ourselves back on a sustainable fiscal path. So that's what I hope we'll do, and I'll be grateful for your help, and uh, I'm grateful for the chance to share these thoughts with you today. Should we thank you, Pat. take some <coughs> questions? Yeah, yeah thank you. Right. <coughs> We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, let me maybe start out with one. You talk about process reform and so forth. Can you maybe give us a few seconds on prospects for that, or if it's balanced budget, or you know, going back to a Graham Rudman kind of approach, which I've sort of been pushing because it was the only thing that actually worked, and right. it did work in the '80s before we got rid of it for the during the Bush tax increases. Yeah. But uh, is that the kind of thing you're talking they, about? They are, and, and there's, there are a number of us having conversations um, within the Republican conference in the Senate over, um, uh, over, first of all, whether or not we will tie a condition to support for the debt limit increase. I mean, I can tell you personally, I won't support an increase in the debt limit unless we have some significant reforms. Uh, I'm not sure that that's uh, the consensus view of my colleagues. I know I'm not alone in that view, but I'm, I'm not quite sure how broadly held it is. I would, in my mind, a balanced budget amendment that's properly constructed would definitely qualify. In fact, it'd be terrific. It would really put a straitjacket on the federal spending that we, I think, badly need. But I also know that that's a really hard process. It's hard to get the two-thirds hurdle, and then you've got to get three-quarters of the states, which might not be as tough as the two-thirds in yeah. Congress. Um, and so I think something, uh, the Graham-Rudman model, uh, some kind of statutory spending caps that um, uh, you know, the, the, the importance of having it in statute instead of the budget resolution, as you know, is when it's statute, in order to overcome it, you need to overcome the 60-vote hurdle in the Senate, yeah. whereas if it's in the budget resolution, uh, there are mechanisms by which they can defeat it with a simple majority in the Senate. So we want to set as high a hurdle as possible. I think all of those things should be on the table. Okay, good. Thank you. We're open for questions. We have a microphone, if you would mind. Senator Phil Kirpin, Americans for Prosperity. Uh, I'm very concerned with the argument that some of our friends are making that uh, prioritizing debt payment somehow means putting the Chinese ahead of Americans, this sort of xenophobic argument. I wonder if you might address that. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, there's a several ways to address that, I would say. Uh, number one, let's uh, point out that a big majority of all our debt is held by Americans. It's held in 401k plans and IRA plans. It's held in pension funds. It's municipalities that... Uh, invest in treasuries as a way to handle cash flow management, small businesses likewise. So, you know, first and foremost, um, it's, it's mostly Americans uh, who hold this. A and secondly, it's um, uh, prioritizing the, the debt service takes a very small fraction of the ongoing tax revenue. So there's lots of other priorities that can be covered. But ultimately, we can avoid this whole problem. If the administration sits down with us and says, we're willing to make some process reforms, then I think we should go along with the debt ceiling increase if we have those reforms that will allow us to get this spending under control. So I, th I think that's an argument by those who are, are really trying to back us into a situation where we raise the debt limit without getting the structural reforms we need in return. Senator Larry Hunter with the Alliance for Retirement Prosperity. I can't uh, compliment you enough for what you're doing. Um, and uh, uh, give you great encouragement. L let me suggest, um, and I know you don't like to change your bill, nobody likes to change the bill, but one thing you're going to hear, I'm afraid, is the demagogue uh, from the left on Social Security. Uh, 
And certainly you're correct that uh, debt service is different than paving the streets or uh, uh, putting turf on the mall. But I would suggest that many people in the country uh, see Social Security as equally important, if not more important really than uh, paying the bonds. And since Social Security has its own dedicated revenue source that should not be used for paving streets or uh, putting turf on the lawn, uh, I would li I'd like you to consider at least prioritizing Social Security as well. I think it will allow you to reach out to the Democrats, and I think this puts everybody in the position that we could all uh, uh, gather together around this concept. It's a great concept, and it would prevent a lot of demagoguery that Social Security checks won't go out. Uh, it's a valid point, and I certainly don't want to see any interruption in Social Security payments whatsoever. Uh, if, uh, if we get to the point where I can introduce my legislation uh, in the form of an amendment, say, to something in the Senate, it's possible that someone might want to, uh, you know, add to that a secondary amendment that would cover Social Security, and I think that we'd, we'd have a constructive discussion about that. But I, I, think, I think you make a valid point. Uh, my, my focus is on the, the more narrow uh, idea of let's just avoid default, take that off the table, and then negotiate you know, meaningful reforms, but I, but I take your point. We'll take a last question. Does anybody have a last question here? If not, we'll, we'll wrap up. And Senator, right. thank you again. Hey, thank Appreciate you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.